Hello my Eagle friends, very nice to see you and um, you're just on time. We've got some crazy weather here, uh, really crazy. Um, of all places, you know, uh, Jack and I are off to the Aleutians, right? The Aleutian Islands, we'll talk about that in a while. But the crazy thing really is that it's been snowing nonstop today in Vancouver, which really gave quite a havoc. My special guest, who's supposed to be here, and you'll hear who our surprise guest is in a moment, um, is actually connected. I quickly went to his house, helped him connect and so on. So hopefully the technology works. And Jack, I'm just trying to get him back online. I don't know, he's suddenly disappeared. So it's, it's a normal day here, okay? So everything's fine. But anyway, um, so, uh, so we're going from the heat to the cold. Uh, I'm just going to, uh, we're going to keep it rather short today because I'm going to get up very early tomorrow morning. And there will be no big nest updates, uh, except for one thing that, uh, that I will want to talk about. So there have been a, new ha a few new hatches. One of them has been in Iowa, the decora nest. I saw that there has been, sorry, an egg laid yesterday and a few others. There's been no recent hatches, right? But the big wave is still coming, of course, in March and, and April as we then move to the uh, northwest coast and right up to, to Canada. So there's the big batch of, of eggs and hatches is still ahead, right? But of course, we have the Northeast Florida nest. Uh, hi to all, the, all my friends there, all the mods. And from the Southwest, of course, where, where uh, Rosanna and I were, was a really exciting time. So anyway, let's jump right into the Aleutians. What I'm going to show you is a quick map of the Aleutians before we go there. Uh, let's see now. There we go. I'm just going to sit down. So the Aleutians are incredibly interesting uh, because, and I'm just going to make myself a lot smaller here so you can see the, uh, the map a lot better. So this is, uh, this is a map of the Aleutians. And what you can see is you can see this ridge that, that forms like a semicircle all the way uh, from, from, uh, from the northwest. Uh, right, sorry, from the east now, we're talking about the east, of course, where the east side is, 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 uh, is Alaska, right? You've got Anchorage uh, uh, more or less on the top, and then you've got this ridge walk going right across, um, uh, so, sort of in, in, in a bowl, all the way to, to Russia, to Kam Kamchatka. It's a very volcanic region. There are over 40 volcanoes in that region. It's a very rich uh, um, fishing region and Dutch Harbor is located there right in the middle where that yellow spot is. I'm not going to enlarge it at the moment because I don't want my technology to break down but um, that's uh, that's how it looks. So it's a very exciting uh, travel and um, before we get there I just quickly wanted to say a few words. One second I'm going to put myself in again. And, and this is really um, a sad story, right? It's a sad story. There's been the nest in Barry. Uh, you, you probably remember I had uh, Professor Rene, uh, Rene Carlton, uh, no, sorry, Dr. Rene Carlton. She's an associate professor at Barry College, uh, the Department of Biology. Or it's actually mathematics and um, I think it's mathematics, but she's, in the she's a biologist there. Um, it was exactly 10 days uh, on uh, February 13th when B10 uh, and B11 were born. And now a week has, uh, sorry, 10 days have passed. And last night a big tragedy happened because uh, you can clearly see it on the camera, one of the um, uh, eaglets fell out, right? And was, uh, was unfortunately didn't make it, is dead. I do understand the incredible emotions that go with it. I completely sympathize with that. I mean, we know how tragic um, uh, we, we uh, associate with eaglets and their nature, especially through the web cameras, which has been such so fantastic. So again, my heartiest condolences. I know it doesn't make you feel any better. Uh, all the all the friends at Barry uh, who watch the Barry Nest, my sincere my sincere condolences. I'm uh, really deeply saddened by it. The only thing I can say: this is life, right? And life goes on. The eagles go on. <laughs> They'll raise the little one. It's been the only tragedy that we've had at Barry College, but I do understand it doesn't make you feel better. But hey, that's that's the way we uh, we uh, witness things through the live cameras now. Okay. So um, I don't know at the moment where Captain Jack is. One sec. I'm just going to give me a second. I think I'm going to add him again. Uh, get Jack back on. Yes. Oops. He's disappeared again. Joe, just give me a second. I'm having slight 
problems here. One sec, he's disappeared again. Ah, here he is. One second, just give me a sec. Because I will... Uh, uh, <laughs> Jack, can you hear me? One sec. Okay. I, I hope we don't have a feedback because I'm hearing some feedback at the moment. I hope you don't hear feedback. So uh, uh, I hope that's resolved. I'm going to try and get Jack and Jack back on the screen now. Uh, a little bit tricky at the moment because we've had some technical issues. So just give me a second to get them both back on. Uh, Okay, okay, one sec. I'm going to, I'll have to add you both again because we've run into slight problems here. Uh, okay, we don't seem to have a feedback, but I'm getting a feedback in my, in my uh, headphones. One second. Uh, let me just see. Uh, sorry about this. This is not trivial stuff. Um, okay, there I've got Captain Jack on there now. What I'm going to, what I was trying to do now is get both sim simultaneous our surprise guest too, <laughs> uh, which was which we neatly organized before. But now that's the surprise guest. So I that's can see you, <laughs> David I can Hancock. See you. Okay, yeah. So, so I can just, see and hear you. And now, and now Jack's gone again. I don't know why. <laughs> Oh my goodness, I, I think there are some internet problems, but okay. So anyway, um, David, whilst I try and resolve the rest, um, so we are very happy. Oh, there comes Jack again. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Everything's going upside down today. <laughs> One sec. There, Jack is back. Okay, one sec. Okay, we got Jack back. Okay, we got Jack back. Yeah, that's about six seconds delay. I, I understand that, but hang on. Okay. Okay, so hang on. So what I'm going to try uh, until I get both of them on the same screen, uh, sorry about that. I mean, this is the first time ever trying this and, and everything was fine an hour ago. But uh, um, let me just get um, David Hancock. David, can you just um, maybe say just a few words I, to... Well, uh, I, I'm, I'm, first off, I'm very pleased to be here. I mean, uh, I may be a surprise guest, but at the moment, I, <laughs> partly I seem to be the only guest. But now Jack is back and he's not back. Anyway... It's wonderful to be here. The only downside, and I have to report this, other than the sadness of the very nest, which we'll go into in a minute, is that the two of you are going to Dutch Harbor tomorrow, and I'm not. I mean, that's that's a disappointment, I have to tell you. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, pleased to be here. Uh, let, um, is now Jack, I can see Jack on my screen, and he's shaking his head. He can see me. And I can see Christian smiling and peering. So I, I look as though I can see everything, but you're having trouble. So I'll, I'll just continue drinking my wine unless you want me to talk about something. <laughs> Cheers. Oh, now Jack has come up parallel to me. I see I see you and Jack simultaneously. 
David, what I wanted to ask you is, can you just say a few words about the berry nest, the incident that happened yeah. and, and, and how it relates to your own life and your experience, please? Thank you. Well, let, let's face it, eagles, like all species, ha have tragedies. And when you live in a nest 100 feet up a tree and you've got a, a, a hole for a young eagle, you've got about a five or six foot diameter, maybe eight foot diameter uh, world in front of you, and you live in, as a, a hatching egg uh, in a tiny 16, 18 inch diameter nest cup of soft area, you start to gain as, as a young eaglet some degree of, of mobility and you begin to move around, but your coordination is definitely not high and it is not at all uncommon. We just don't often get to see it, but it is not uncommon for an eaglet to literally walk off the edge of a nest. And obviously one of the reasons a nest is a cup shaped, it's a bowl, is that it helps roll the chicks back into the center and they roll into the nest cup, which is mosses and lichens and grasses because it's soft, but it's also warm. And because it's a little bit lower than the rim, it's also out of the wind. So the, the design, the inherent design of a cup and a bowl in which these eaglets are, the eggs are laid and the chicks are hatched is really in favor of this kind of random movement of a chick. If it gets too close to the edge, it kind of rolls back in. The parents just don't do that. They don't pull them back in. They leave the movements of the chick up to, to the chick, but there's a natural tendency to come back into both to seek warmth from the parent, but, but also to, to fall back into the center of the nest because the outward rim is a bit higher. Now, sometimes this doesn't work. Some eagles just don't build a very big nest. We've got a pair right now out at our Harrison Mills. Those darn birds have not built much of a nest this year. And we had a pair at White Rock, as you know, for years. That was a very poor housekeeping pair. They just did not build this outer rim up and, and that didn't encourage the chicks. Now we didn't lose a chick there, but it was a, a great worry all the time that we, we might. And that's what's happened here. The chick has literally moved in its kind of random exercise movements, has moved and fallen off the nest. And that's, that's very unfortunate, but it's one of those things that we've seen happen before and, and it's going to happen again. And, and that's just the way it, that it goes with evolution says the chicks i want to roll back into the center i mean they're the ones that keep doing that they survive and the ones that don't they roll the other way okay thank you very much david that, i think uh, that, that'll give some comfort to the berry berry people i mean you see it very much as a biologist as a naturalist and i think that's a very important view so what, what i'm going to do now is i unfortunately wanted to get both of you on the screen now i can't do it live because i don't want to interrupt the screen so what we need to do is i'm going to switch from one camera to the next and one to uh, from one to the other but you can both be heard i think at the same time that sh that should work so i'm going to just switch the camera now to to uh, to captain oh, you jack <laughs> okay oh okay so uh anyway i'm very pleased to have have uh, uh jack molin here um there there uh, uh, gosh everything seems to be playing up today i don't know what it is but they're supposed to be david hancock on the left side uh, jack molin on the right side and anyway jack so you're about to get ready um for the illusion adventure so well Roll it out. Uh, what is what are the illusions about? <laughs> well, oh man, that's a great question. Um, in fact, Christian and I had a phone call today, and he's going, "Oh my gosh, the weather's terrible." And I said, "Just hang with me, man. We may have to stop in Anchorage. We may get stuck in Dutch Harbor. You just never know. The weather out there right now is blowing between forty and fifty. It's broadcast to go down to thirty and then back up to forty again, and that's just normal." That's just how it is out there. It's uh, one of the windiest places on earth. And the eagles are extremely uh, robust. Or, uh, I mean, they're survivors. 
they, they thrive. They don't just survive. It's a, it's a really fascinating place to see. You would never think to find that kind of wildlife out there in such a harsh conditions, but it's also one of the richest fishing ports in the world. And the fish that come in naturally in the bays and in on the boats um, feed a very large group of eagles out there. And many of you probably know Christian and I uh, made a trip out there before. Uh, we kind of broke ground as photographers. I, I went out there as a fisherman that had been there for 30 years. So I got some funny looks from people like, what are you doing out here with a camera? But I had this famous uh, photographer. Does an excuse. It was a lot of fun. So we're going to try to repeat that. We have some new equipment. We have some. We have a better internet connection. And we're not going to tell you everything, but I, we're looking forward to a great trip. Well, that's right. We have some surprises up our sleeves. And if everything goes well, we'll do some live broadcasting from there. So I just wanted to tell you, start uh, any questions that you have for, for, uh, for Captain Jack and, of course, eagle biologist David Hancock, just roll them out now because this is the chance. So we're going to just uh, limit the, uh, the live broadcast to another 20, 30 minutes uh, because we're both getting up very early and hopefully everything goes well on my side because <laughs> uh, we got a snowstorm here, which is really rare. You know, for, for and that on on uh, so late in February, but it's just the way it is. They planned this, <laughs> but anyway. Uh, so yeah, um, Jack, how many times have you been in in in, in Dutch Harbor? Actually, it must be. I don't. I don't think oh, you, you can count. I can't count it. The first time I saw the Aleutian Islands was February of 1980, and I've been going up there every year since. And you know, sometimes six eight months out of the year, it's been a second home. <laughs> at times I hated it. At times I just couldn't believe how wonderful it was. It's just a land of extremes, I'll tell you. So I'm very familiar with it, though, I can tell you. And what has changed in all the time? Have the, have the eagles actually increased there in number? You know, that's a good question. Um, some winters we don't see them as much as we do other winters. And I don't know if it's that they are uh, getting plenty of food somewhere else. Of course, wintertime, now these eagles don't nest until April or May. You see them start to mate, which is quite late compared to down south there, I think. So in the wintertime, they are all about eating and all about getting strong. And um, the really cool thing is when you come in with a boat with fish chunks on your boat and bait, they know just what to look for. I think they even know the boats and different groups of eagles hit different boats. And suddenly you've got a row of 20 or 30 eagles sitting on your boat. I was never... I never, uh, I was always fascinated by that. You know, a lot of fishermen could care less, but I, I just never got over it myself. Okay, so I'll, um, I'm, I'm going to jump over to, to David Hancock now. David, um, I mean, you, you've always been interested in, in the Aleutian Islands. What, what would your attraction be there? Well, the, the Aleutians is this great arc of volcanic islands that strings from that southern point in the, of the, the Aleutian Peninsula in, in Alaska in a, in a big arc right over almost to the Kamchatka Peninsula. In fact, the last island in this chain, this big arc of, of the Aleutians, the, in fact, it's part of the same arc, is the, the Kuril Islands and Commander Islands actually in in um, in Russia they Russia claimed the last two islands of the Aleutian chain um, and then it, there's a deep channel and north of this Aleutian chain is one of the richest probably the world's richest set of seas first the deep water immediately from the as it drops off from the Aleutians up until you get the great basin coming to the surface uh, uh, which is the the um, Bering Sea land bridge and i mean this is a very famous place this is where it's believed that most of the human invasions of early north america happened people literally walked from asia and they walked across this land bridge and it's only now about 50 55 meters deep but when 18,000 years ago and even slightly more recently that area was 600 and something feet lower water level, which meant that all that land underneath that, that great bearing, the, the shallows of the Bering Sea, was all high and dry. Mm -hmm. And the reason the sea, the oceans of the world, were 600 feet lower is all that water was tied up as ice uh, on the continent. And as a result, 
people could actually walk. And it's believed that <laughs> that's the main way people got that's to incredible. North America. They walked across there and then came down the coast. Some of them walked across into the central parts of North America and came down e east of the Rocky Mountains. So uh, that richness, as the waters of the glaciers melted and the sea came up, it invaded that great shallows. And of course, everywhere in the world, where you have richness, you have shallow water with lots of fresh water interacting with fresh water and lots of sunlight. Those The combination of fresh water and salt water mixed with sunlight makes for productive plankton. And that plankton is what feeds all the krill and the small things which feed the cod and the, and the bigger shrimps and the that feeds everything, including all the way up to the seabirds and the whales and the salmon, of course. So it's the richness of this interface between fresh water, salt water, with sunlight on those shallow waters. That's the rich part of the world. And this country that Jack is so familiar with is, is probably the, the total richest uh, sort of thousand square miles in, in the entire world. Right, David. I think people just love your enthusiasm as much as they love Jack's enthusiasm. Oh. That, that's absolutely great. So I'm sorry, I'll have to switch cameras again. So I'm going to switch my camera now to, 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 to Jack again. Um, Jack, there's a question coming up here from Beach Girl 75 How long does it take to get there and how are you guys traveling there? Well, the question, how long, is an interesting question. Yeah. So here you go. That's a great question. Well, uh, Christian's flying from Vancouver, Canada, and I'm flying from uh, Central Oregon. And we are scheduled to be out in Dutch Harbor by 3 or 4 in the afternoon. That's if everything goes well. Um, I have seen people get excited from my eagle photography. I knew a guy that had five days to go out there. And I said, five days is not very long, man. He spent one day flying. He, stopped, he got stopped in Anchorage. He spent three days in Anchorage waiting for the weather to get better so he could get out there. He spent all his money. He finally got an airplane and came home. His whole vacation he spent in Anchorage in an airport because you can't get out there. It's just like this forbidden country. And once you're out there, you end up staying a long time. It's just crazy. So by boat, it takes us seven days. And believe it or not, if you, just guess how far north you got to go to get to the Bering Sea from Seattle. Just take a wild guess. I'll give you the number. I only go 300 miles north from Seattle before I go west for six days. And when I go west for six days to get to Dutch Harbor, I'm actually 500 miles west of Hawaii, of, the, of Kauai. We are so far out west, and we're actually quite far south. We're almost as far south as the top of Vancouver Island. It's Is a it very different place. Well, isn't that uh, fascinating? I have to ask you, especially, you, you know, from, from a person from the States, because um, I've mentioned, you know, I remember even being at the airport in Anchorage and I say, I'm going to the Aleutians. Most people didn't have a clue. You know, it's actually one of the most beautiful parts of the States, at least in my opinion. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, it's a thousand miles long, which is the, about the length of the American coastline on the West Coast. And there's 10,000 uh, person population. 8,000 of them live in Dutch Harbor. It's basically thousands of uninhabited islands out there. Unbelievable. I mean, it's, it, it is the land that time forgot. It's as remote and as exotic as anywhere down in uh, Patagonia or anywhere, but it doesn't get any, doesn't get any press. It's, a, it's an interesting place. Right. Um, and I don't actually, <laughs> I don't know if you know the answer to this one, Jack, but Swamp 5050 says, isn't that there where they think Amelia Earhart crashed? Do you know about that? No, I think she was in the South Pacific, wasn't she? I did see the site actually where uh, Will Rogers crashed up in by Point Barrow, where he died, and it's confirmed. But Amelia Earhart, I think she was out in the South Pacific somewhere. Right, very good. Okay, well, there you go. Okay, I will turn it back to David Hancock again. Well, uh, I want to ask Jack a question because, and I should know the answer to this, but w I mean, one of the fascinating things you talk about the richness and, and the diversity, w one of the things that we, it is no longer diverse. In fact, it's 
extinct is one of the great marine mammals of the world. It's called the stellar sea cow. There is a big sea cow. You were just in Florida, and there they have the manatee or sea cow. There was a North Pacific sea cow, even bigger than the one in, in Florida. And it was thought to be fictional. You know, we've published a number of books about so-called cryptozoology, creatures that have never been confirmed by science. And for years, there were these legends about the Stellar sea cow. Well, it turns out, Mr. Stellar, a naturalist that came along, he found and he spent a whole season looking down from a bay. And the question I had for Jack was, does he remember what island it was in the Aleutian chain that he got marooned in? And he spent a whole winter observing this bay full of stellar sea cows, and he defined their biology and their eating and their mating. And the world thought he made it all up because nobody had ever else ever got to see this animal because then it became extinct. But of course, in the middens, the, the, the garbage dumps of the native people who lived there, they, they have been a lot of bones because they caught this animal. So there has been recollections or, or confirmation, I should say, of, of his observations and finding all these bones, but nobody else has ever seen these animals alive. Um, uh, did you ever in your life, A, find when you were up there any of these uh, stellar sea cow bones? And do you remember which island in the Aleutian chain Stellar spent that um, that uh, season observing them? Okay, Jack, uh, can you hear me? You don't, you don't have to look at me. Okay. Um, you know, I've only heard that story one other time, and because stellar sea lions are so prevalent up there, and stellar's name, I mean, they're stellar riders, they're stellar, there's all kinds of stellar things. So, well, the stellar's evil, but um, I think he was out by ANAC. Because if you're going to talk about other things, there's the Stellar's J, which happens to be Stellar's the J, sure. of British Columbia. Yeah. That's our, na that's our <laughs> state bird. <laughs> yeah, he, he got a lot of stuff named. But I think he was farther out on the chain. You know, the chain arcs down. The bottom yes. of that chain is absolutely only as far north as the top of Vancouver Island. It's, it's almost tropical. It has yeah. a warm Japanese current coming up there. It's amazing. Yeah, but you no, don't I don't remember know the specific. I don't remember the specific bay. No, no. Seems okay, plenty well, of it's, lines, a, it's one of these other creatures that's emblematic yeah. of how rich the area was. It is supported yeah. this great sea mammal. I mean, now, I mean, you've been out there and seen these six, eight, ten million shearwaters that gather in mm -hmm. a flock. They they come all the way from New Zealand every year yes. to feed on the plankton that and and right. so on the krill that is just coming, being produced by this upwelling current when it right. gets into that zone of fresh and salt water and sunlight. Mm -hmm. It's just so productive and, you know, it's countless. It's a sight to behold. There, those, those that very same area where those shearwaters are is completely covered by uh, humpback whales. And I'm not yeah. exaggerating when I say I probably see a thousand humpback whales at once, you know, on the same strip of, of ground, what we call a strip, which is a, a, a depth, working the same curl that the Shearwaters are working. It is an explosion of life. It's unbelievable. It's also where the great herd of of the uh, gray whales go. You know, we have the gray whales that spawn and breed on the islands or the bays off uh, Baja, Mexico, and right. they come up our Washington, Oregon, Oregon, Washington, and British Columbia coast, and then they go due westward out to cross the Pacific, and and the reason is to get on that inside mm -hmm. uh, of the Aleutian chain where those shallows are, and they can feed all all summer and, and mm -hmm. early fall on on the on the same krill. Mm -hmm. The amazing thing is those whales are actually the Navy studied that they will dive down to a thermal climb of water and send out a signal all the way to Hawaii. I know that sounds like that's crazy, but it's not. And they're telling their friends, hey, it's really good this year. You should come here. <laughs> gathering. Amazing communications. They have the same ability that you and Christian have of sending out a signal to people in the world to go to Dutch Harbor and the Bering oh, Sea because brother. this is where the eagles are going to gather. And they're yeah. gathering for exactly the same reason. Yeah. I mean, it's that richness of plankton that brings the richness mm -hmm. of the of the salmon and the cod and everything, which of course is what's feeding 
the Eagles. Yep. Okay. Did I you want to? Uh, did yeah. you want to get involved, Christian? <laughs> yes. No. Well, no. You're you're doing fantastic. You 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 know. I'm having a beer in the background, so I'm I'm fine. Uh, let me just. Uh, there's there's something from my friend Mark Horner. Of course, you both met Mark Horner. Um, maybe Jack can talk a little bit about Christian's legacy legacy tolerance for Dutch Harbor cold and wind. You know. Um, you know. Remember when we pulled out the Pollocks and so on. I think I have quite a tolerance for cold. Maybe you can say something oh about it. Oh, my gosh. I was putting in two pairs of gloves in my bag today, and I told my wife, I said, you know, Christian never wears gloves. In fact, I think his hands are steaming out there in the cold weather. I thought, there is no way, man. My hands will freeze in five minutes. And he doesn't wear gloves when he's operating those cameras. There's not a whole lot of movement. It's amazing. <laughs> Okay, I can see David is, is multitasking here. He's taking a phone up. <laughs> well, this is what makes more okay. more wine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, cheers. Cheers, cheers David. <laughs> cheers. So, um, yeah, David, uh, let, let, let me just say, Lisa is asking, did you say 8,000 eagles reside there? I, th I don't know where she understood that. No, no. no I, I was talking about seven or eight, 9,000 or million, million uh, of the uh, shearwaters. They come all the way up from New Zealand where they breed and they come up to have that take advantage of that blossom of, of the krill and the shrimp and so on. I, I don't know how many eagles there are out on the uh, Aleutians. I mean, it's a pretty good population of breeding birds and there's a very good population of wintering birds and particularly enhanced by the fact that this great f fishing fleet out of Dutch Harbor throws out a lot of spare food. I mean, the, the, the bait that's left hook and the small fish that get entangled in the nets, often that comes ashore and people are able, the eagles are then able to come down right on the decks of the boat, which, I mean, you saw last time and I'm sure you're going to do some awesome broadcasting about the, the, the eagles come down and eat it right in front of people and the big change, the really big change is the attitude with which the with which the fishermen now regard the eagle i mean back when i started my studies in 53 and did my first surveys there was still a bounty paid in alaska on killing eagles so it's, you know it's in my lifetime my first year of getting involved in aerial surveys they were still paying two dollars for each pair of eagle legs in alaska well that changed that was a bounty and a bonus to the fishermen and the game wardens so that they, when they were out there, they got some money uh, for their effort. They could kill eagles. Well, when that was ended and eagles became protected, then you got this phenomena happening as happens here. As, as Christian knows, we go out and we've been catching eagles every day. We caught 13 eagles this past week for banding. But up there, it's the same thing. The eagles land on the decks of boats and people's pe people's um, uh, condos because they're so tame. They have not been persecuted and killed for a long time. And that's about this change of human attitudes. We can change. And the best sign of this is the response of eagles. They learn to associate and get free food from around human beings. And the fish docks are one of the easiest places for them to make a living, and you're going to the heart of that, right, in, in Dutch Harbor. Yeah, you're throwing the spice in there, David. That's absolutely true. And may, maybe, Jack, you can comment. Here's a question. How big are the eagles at Dutch Harbor? <laughs> well, I have to warn you, I'm an Alaska fisherman, right? So you want to be careful about stories, but I think they're bigger than any eagles I've ever seen. They are enormous. I'm, the females, I would say, probably have a seven-foot wingspan. They're a little bit larger than the males. And um, I think they live in such a rich area. You know, I'm not a biologist or anything else, but they just eat so well. And they're protect. They're not. They're the top of the food chain. And like David said, in fact, maybe Christian and I can really try to work on this, is that it's an amazing uh, association between heavy industry and this eagle population. You always picture eagles out in the wild and up in the trees. These guys are sitting around on 40-foot flatbed trailers waiting for some food to come in. I mean, it's just wild to see, you know, and, and everybody's getting along. Nobody's fighting or you never see them. It's pretty fun. It's a unique thing, but uh, 
I would say they're bigger than maybe Christian can say that, but they are bigger than the Eagles down south. Well, maybe David. Well, I, oh, David, yeah, can I, comment? Can, I can address that quite quickly. Yeah, or, really. the, in almost every species, is one of the, and I never remember whether it's Gloger, Gloger or Allen's rule, but the two kind of principles in biology, as you go from the south to the north, things go from lighter colored wool or plumage, fur or feathers, and darker as you get north. And the same thing, they go from lighter animals in the south to heavier animals in the north. And, and you're getting all those really northern Alaska birds, even though you're partly south, the northern birds come and, and winter out on the Aleutians, just like some of them come down here. And the biggest birds that we catch down here, we hope to prove are all Alaskan birds. I mean, the, we caught one yesterday, a big female, but she was only about 11 pounds. And that's small by northern Alaska points of view. So I, you're quite right. You have the biggest eagles, and the females are probably able to go to 14, 14 and a half pounds, and the males are probably 10, 11 pounds. Well, Quite, David, I mean, here comes big. a provocative question then. Could this be uh, some hybrid uh, possible between the stellar and, 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 uh, and the bald eagle, what we see there? No, not at all. No, it's nothing, it's nothing to do with hybridization at all. Um, what this is to do, is Jack hit the nail on the head. Part, well, partly, it's the, as you go north, the lands are generally richer, but also when it's colder, there's an advantage in having a bigger body weight. You hold your heat better inside your fur or your feather mass and your down mass. So you lose less percentage when you're bigger. So it, the farther north and the colder you are capable of tolerating, the, the, the bigger you are, the more you can tolerate. So same way in the, in the southern eagles down in Baja and, and in Florida, they're much, much smaller eagles. And, and of course, in the north, is, is, as Jack has said, they get huge amounts of food. I mean, it, it is so much food out there. Very good. And here's a question for Jack uh, from Waterbug85. Does Captain Jack fish for crabs out of Dutch Harbor commercially? Um, yes, I did. I started my career in 1980 there fishing crab. We fish crab up through 1986. Um, maybe they'll have a link. I just did a podcast on my career in Alaska. It's an hour long and it goes over all the crabbing and how we changed over to trawling. But yeah, I've done plenty of crabbing, and if you're referring to the, you know, the Deadliest Catch show, I know all those guys were, you know, I've driven their boats, that sort of thing. So, yeah, it's all part of the deal. Very good. Yeah, don't, uh, they'll hear much more now, now that I've finally got the technology. I've got you both on the screen. I've got your titles properly, so everybody can believe now what you see. It's no more fiction. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so I got, I got all that fixed up in the meantime, but, I, but you can't see me, but that's not important. Um, let me just throw in a few um, interesting comments here because, um, you know, someone was just commenting here, David, this is for you on the uh, Florida Eagles. Now, the question would be if we put a Florida Eagle into Alaska, will it become that big? Well, I doubt. Um, it, it doesn't mean if you didn't give it a lot of food, it wouldn't put on an extra pound or two, but they've probably got maximum food available to them in Florida. So what you've evolved over time, over time, and that's the thing here, over time, the Florida Eagles found it advantageous to be smaller because they can get rid of the heat. Where in the north, they've got bigger and bigger because they want to retain the heat. So it, over hundreds of thousands or a few, maybe a few million years, maybe a million years, um, you're right. An Alaska's birds and his descendants would presumably, if it survived, it would become heavier but the likelihood is you take a florida bird and stick him into alaska number one he probably doesn't have the thick down and uh, therefore he probably wouldn't do very well up there in the cold weather because he doesn't have the insulation layer okay now it gets even more provocative uh so what if you take a chick uh, that, that that and and you uh you basically bring it up in alaska and then release it would that work 
<laughs> you mean release it in the south? Yes, it's born. Let's say we t take the northeast Florida. We take we take we take one. I know it's all fictitious, but it's an interesting discussion. And then well, we, you know. yeah, that, I mean, this is a that's a very practical question. Um, you know, eagles when they were persecuted and the numbers went way down by both human persecution and pesticide. Then later pesticides in in the fifties and into the sixties. There was a huge a project of breeding in captivity eagles and then re releasing them back into the areas where they needed to be. Well, one of the big questions being asked is where, what population of eagles do you take your breeding stock from, which is kind of what you're talking about. And British Columbia gave a lot of eagles initially to California, to the coast of California, because we had lots. And so we gave them to the San Francisco Zoo and they took those chicks and raised them and then they released them in California. And we know they did quite well. Now, the coastal climate is more uniform than the interior climate. So if you, when you go to populate an area like Florida or even the southern states up the Mississippi, the question came, where do you choose your breeding stock? And the guy who did most of this is Steve Sherrod um, at the Sutton Aviacultural Center. He very smartly, I think, particularly when you consider the world is changing, it's getting warmer as you go north, he chose breeding stock to breeding captivity for releasing in Oklahoma. So he chose Florida stock. And I thought that was a really good decision. N number one, they were the lighter, better adapted to warm birds. And number two was as time went on, that would be a really good thing because it's getting warmer and warmer. So he chose breeding stock, just like you're kind of inferring from the South, to release in Oklahoma and Texas. And so uh, your answer is try to keep the breeding stock as for release um, as close to where ecologically it's from. Okay, thank you very much, David. We got some more interesting questions here, really uh, quite pertinent questions. So um, this is coming back to the berry nest now from David Maxine uh, Wirth, just goodness. Uh, want to know if the raptor would instinctively know uh, whether when the eaglet is gone? That's a great question, actually. You're asking me. Uh, well, boy, those are really difficult questions. I, I think it's pretty apparent that almost all creatures seem to sense the loss. I mean, when you intimately get involved with these creatures, it, it, it's, <laughs> it's pretty obvious they have a sensitivity to these things. So I, I would say, yes, they are going to know they've lost it, whether they count one, two, three, and, and do a, a, a count every day to how many young they've got and whether they're both there or not. I don't know if their brain processes things that way, but certainly the, the parent will know it's lost a young. I think that's just inevitable that they, they see this. Yeah, that's very good. And now comes some. Uh, now it gets even more difficult. Uh, um, so, uh, so you're going to see uh, it's probably directed at both of you. Uh, I certainly wouldn't know how to answer this. So, um, I think Jackie Porter writes: Is climate change affecting the eagles of the Aleutians? Wow, here's a question. Go for it, Jack. You know, I get asked. I'm sorry. I, I speak. Uh, one of the things I'm doing now, since I don't fish, is I go and do public speaking. And usually at the end of my presentation, I sit, open it up for questions. And generally, I get two questions. How did you get started fishing? And how has climate change affected fishing? And I have to admit that as a fisherman, I was worried about the weather the next day. I really was. Or the next two days or the next three days. And halfway through a winter season we would start talking that wow this is a really cold season or this is a really windy season you either get a really cold season or you get a really windy season if it's warmer it's windier and i don't know if i could honestly say i've seen any change over the last 20 years i think the windows my own belief is the window is way too short for that sort of thing um we've had years where the ice comes way down and years where it doesn't um the eagles they seem to be increasing um 
I remember eagles all, my whole fishing life, but I think since I started shooting photos, you really look for them, and um, they are there. So I really don't have an answer on that one. Yeah, I think it's a, but I think I think you answered it very well, Jack. Here's a question for both of you: Have you thought about a book on eagle photographs, Jack? Are we going to do it? <laughs> <laughs> That's a tough one. Um, books are expensive to make. Books are really expensive to make, and picture books are really, really expensive to make. And I have looked into it and, uh, you know, looked at the cheapest printing from China, and I'd still have to charge 50 or 60 bucks for uh, a good, because you got to get a big enough format to get a decent photo in there. And uh, I know Christian has made one book early in his career, and it's, uh, I, I, I think we'd end up going backwards. I hate to say it as much as I'd like to do it because I just love what I'm doing. I'm not doing it because I'm going to get rich, but I just don't want to go backwards, you know? Yeah, well, I I'll, I, I'm going to jump in there because as, as you know, not only am I a biologist, my life has been publishing. So I publish book. In fact, I published Christian's book. So, and, and I've done a, a, a lot of books on eagles and, and, and other related topics, 600 books. So there's always a market, but... Jack put his finger on it. The, the challenge is there's an awful lot of books now out there on eagles. And while I, Christian and I have been talking about doing a big book, and we are going to do one on eagles, and it's going to focus at least on the, this incredible population of eagles in the Harrison and the Fraser River, which is the valley right here. This is the world's biggest population. But there's certainly potential for a chapter or something relating to this uh, phenomena you have out on uh, on at Dutch Harbor and, and some of these other fishing communities. I mean, it's not unlike what Christian and I deal with here. It's an artificial food supply. I mean, the, the food at Dutch Harbor, it's naturally rich, but why the eagles so gather is because the fishermen accept the eagles and they put the food out for them. I mean, partly wittingly, but partly unwittingly, it's all tangled in the nets that the eagles have access to. And then when people once accepted the eagle as an acceptable part of the ecosystem, the eagles then moved right in and took advantage of the food. It's the same thing as right here in our backyard. I mean, yesterday we, we caught two eagles, but there was 1,200 eagles behind us on the, on the landfill. 1,200 eagles. That's really down. There was 3,000 three weeks ago. So eagles respond well to the food that we give them, particularly when we don't kill them. We kill the eagles. Okay, and here, come, now, now comes a, uh, uh, here, here comes quite, quite, uh, uh, quite a few questions. Uh, first of all, for David, but please answer that in one sentence. What wine are you drinking? <laughs> <laughs> I'm drinking a white wine, and as long as it's white wine and sweet, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Next. I, didn't know, I can't see. You keep saying I'm on the screen. I am not on the broadcast screen that I'm looking at from you. I see Jack and I see you. I don't see me. That's interesting. Um, I didn't um, know people David, could see me David, drinking because I don't see me on the screen. Well, David, what other people see, you better be careful, okay? I'm just Yeah, you. yeah. I, will, I have to be more careful. <laughs> I, I mustn't be doing a, a wine commercial there. You know that the big issue the last little while is we're trying to stop an oil pipeline coming into Vancouver Harbor and spoiling the entire ecosystem here in the Salish Sea. And one of the repercussions... The province next to us, where the oil is coming from, the horrible, filthy tar sands, they're saying, since we don't want to let this filthy oil come into the British Vancouver Harbor and the Salish Sea, they're going to cut off accepting BC wines. So BC wines I'm now drinking because um, Alberta is saying nobody should drink BC wines. Of course, the world is now aware that BC is a winery. It's often, okay. well, I mean, my point is it's about conservation as well. When people talk about something, you get an interest to it. You're talking about Dutch Harbor. That's marvelous. More people will know now know about eagles and conservation because you're talking about this incredibly rich area and how people accept those eagles. They allow them on their boat deck. They allow them on their condominium deck. Right, that's right, aw right. That's awesome. That's incredible. That is. That is, that is absolutely okay. So and now another question away. here. Do mated eagles migrate together? That's a question from Life Light. <laughs> that's, a, that's a difficult one. Well, as you know, we've just started this beta project, bald eagle 
tracking alliance. And we spent the last two weeks and we caught and banded 13 eagles and we were putting trackers on some of these, on the adults. And that gives us a GPS reading of where these birds go. And it's exactly to answer that lady's question. If we get enough of these, we'll find out, are the parents, are the like all the breeding bears, I got 500 breeding pairs in the Fraser Valley. When they leave here, are they leaving together and going somewhere for their fall session? And then are they staying together while they're away or separately? We, we are going to find those questions. To, we're going to find the answers to those questions. Okay. And we're going to find out why we have 3,000 eagles at the Vancouver landfill and 10,000 up on the Harrison. Where on earth are they all coming from? We don't know. We, that's what we want to know. We want to... We, Okay, so Jack, uh, here's a, a first of all remark uh, uh, um, uh, just to David. Are you on a boat you're rocking? Well, I, I assume that's the white wine that's rocking you. And the other question from, uh, from Mark Corner <laughs> is, is um, does Jack feel that the number of herring or, or, or pollock is drastically declined in the Bering Sea? Well, that's maybe something you can comment on. Well, that, since you mentioned herring and pollock, um, there in the Bering Sea, according to the old timers, there's always a dominant species. And in the 50s, it was herring. And herring's extremely rich. It's really oily. It's the perfect food. And as a quick little side story, I was uh, during herring season, I would oftentimes get eagles landing on my boat 10 miles out at sea. And I couldn't figure out why until a native guy said, well, they're watching for the herring to come in. And you're just a, an easy perch. So they'd land up on my mast. And they would just keep an eye out for the herring schools. And then I'm sure they'd go back and tell their buddies, you know, what they saw or didn't see. So uh, the Pollock is an amazing story. Amazing story. They uh, they take a biomass. They figure out how much is there every single year. They spend a lot of money on surveying. And then they allow us to take 10% up to a certain amount of that. And that, that amount has grown for the 30 years that I fished it. I have driven over 100-mile-long schools of Pollock that you couldn't even see the bottom of the ocean. They're so thick. There's so much pollock up there. So they're the dominant species now. Pollock really is. Um, so no, it's not declining. It, it has cycles. It cycles really fast. When they say you're overfishing something, every species of fish is different. Every species of fish takes a different hit when it gets fished on. So you can't, I mean, you can outfish something, some species of fish really fast. And others, you know, they're a lot more resilient. So. That's my quick quick story. Let me add to that about the herring, because the herring uh, all down the so southeast coast from Alaska, British Columbia, even Washington, Oregon, uh, the herring is one of the major small food fishes for feeding the cod and, and the salmon. And we have totally overfished herring. I mean, we, when I was a kid in the 60s and going out and collecting 10 tons in an afternoon with a boat, uh, the, the Commercial boats were killing and letting sink hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands of tons every day on the fishery. They just wasted them because there'd be a few dogfish among them. Today, the, do the herring stocks are way, way down, and it's one of the reasons there's probably less resilience in our salmon stocks locally is because the, one of the basic food sources, at least for three of the salmon species, um, are, are simply a way down in number. And uh, it's one of the reasons why I'm adamantly against this pipeline coming here. When the Exxon Valdez went <coughs> aground in the bay next to the Aleutians there up at Prince William Sound, uh, the herring, the big breeding area for herring was totally destroyed. And that 20 something, 21, 22 years later, the herring stocks have still not come back in Prince William Sound in those areas. They're still covered with oil. And we don't want that happening down here because the herring is just starting to make a recovery because they've been limiting the hunt, the fishing of them. And we don't want the bottom of the Salish Sea covered with oil. So that's one of the reasons we're against the, the oil tankers coming through this area is to protect the herring, to protect the salmon, to protect the bald eagles. Go ahead. Okay, well, thank you very much, David. Well, that's exactly the type of conversation that people love. So, 
Um, I, I can see lots of questions here that people think this is the best uh, interview yet. So it's very nice to have both of you on it. And uh, I mean, they're controversial uh, topics and it's great to have really both of you with, uh, with all your life experience, but with very similar, really with, with very similar ideas and love for animals. So that wait is a minute, great. Wait a minute, wait a minute, Christian. There's not <laughs> been a single controversial question here. This has all just been a, an elucidation of fact. There's nothing controversial. We're just telling you what it is. It's not controversial at all. This is the way it is. It's the great West Coast and it's... <laughs> It's a very rich area. It's not controversy. You got the wrong term. Not controversial at all. Well, I think there was some uh, some difference here in opinion about the uh, about the herring population and so on. No, but, I don't uh, think so. I don't think Jack was disputing the herring. Uh, no, I don't think he had different positions. Okay, you good. Have a different position on herring, Jack. No, I, I have no idea. I've done. I've never done any West Coast stuff. Okay. I just know. Uh, go ahead. We don't need to dig it up. It's it's okay. We're good. Okay, now comes an interesting question. Do Alaskan eagles eat anything other than fish? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, he's dealing with a very specific part of Alaska, and I'll let him answer that because uh, he, uh, he, he's got, a, positive, uh, he's got a, a, a good addition to that. Well, I'm just thinking uh, the very first day I took uh, Christian to Dutch Harbor, we didn't even go to the hotel. We just went out in the truck and started looking for eagles, and there were some eagles crouched what was that thing on the dock it was like this big white chunk of lard or something it was frozen and they were picking away at it and christian went to photograph and i said this is like the ghetto man we got to go find some eagles that are eating fish you know <laughs> i'm sure they'll eat something else but they don't see much else it's all fish it's all about fish you know well octopus, that kind of stuff yeah but there's also Part of the life cycle of bald eagles in many areas is dealing it, on the coast is dealing with dead marine mammals. A dead whale, a dead sea lion, a dead seal, a dead, even a smaller sea otter. These are all really important parts of most of the eagle's food. And when you get eagles on the interior, the winter kill of caribou, of moose, of cattle today, um, and deer, this is also a really important part of the food chain, particularly in the winter. So eagles, when they're scavenging, will take uh, the, the carcasses of a great many species, just like they l basically live for six months on dead salmon. They, they will also supplement that really willingly uh, with all these other carcasses. As I just got three calves today, dead ones, and, and I'm going to use those for bait this coming week for catching eagles. They'll come down and try to consume these dead calves. And, and that's what they are. They're scavengers for most of the year. Uh, okay, hang on. David, here's an interesting question. Can you address the, the, uh, the, the phrase anthropomorphism, which is basically the association or the empathy uh, that we have with, with, with animals, the, you know, the personality and so on? I think that's something sure. you can certainly comment on. Yeah, this was being anthropomorphic 50 years ago, 60 years ago, was the death knell of a biologist. If he used a human term to describe animals, it was thought to be unfashionable. Well, thank God we have changed that absolutely and totally. And one person, one person basically changed it, and that was Jane Goodall in her studies with apes and chimps and so on. Uh, she found that what the chimps were doing was so absolutely human-described behaviors. Why not use human-described behaviors? And it, thank God, today we can interpret many animals using common sense anthropological, anthropomorphic terms, meaning things which relate to human behavior, absolutely relate to animal behavior. So we, we've passed that stigma where the, the, the professional biologist is trying to hold himself off as something different and using different languages, stressing to make common sense of common sense things by, I mean, they were trying to use different terms. Hells, bells, eagles do so many things like humans do, just like bears do and deer do and 
and so on. So, yeah, we've got around that in science, thank God. Yeah, that was a great answer. That was, by the way, the question was from Jerry uh, Blankenberg. Uh, th thanks for the question. It was a great question. And here's another question from Mark Horner to Jack. Jack, when did you actually start photographing eagles? Where did this po this point came because, uh, come? Uh, because uh, that is something very unusual to do the way you do it. Yeah, Mark, I... Uh... I was stuck in Dutch Harbor waiting to get out. No, excuse me. I was stuck, stuck in the airport at Anchorage waiting to fly out to Dutch, of course. And I found a little tiny camera in a uh, vending machine, a little Canon <laughs> digital camera. And I said, hey, I need a camera. It was 150 bucks. And I took it out there. And believe it or not, I shot 13,000 shots that winter. And it was because the boat had just gotten internet, which meant Facebook. As soon as I started putting those eagle pictures on there, people freaked out. And I went, oh, I guess this isn't like anywhere else. And, you know, so that was the beginning of my career. And then I upgraded my equipment from there on. And, uh, you know, I'm always bugging Christian for, for tips on how to shoot these darn things. And he's too busy shooting them, but uh, he'll give me tips here now and then. So it's pretty cool. Well, I don't think you need any tips from me, Jack, really. I mean, you're, you're, I think you have your very own characteristic. I mean, I can, I can uh, certainly... We've talked about that a lot, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and I think I have mine too. And you can see that a lot of photographers also in, in Florida, I have to think, uh, you know, of some of the ground photographers I met there. Uh, I, you know, I can, I can read their signature on, 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 you know, on the pictures. It's quite remarkable how we do that. And, mm -hmm. and maybe that is part of the emotions that we put in that, uh, you know, David was talking about. It is our own personal emotion that we put into the camera. It's not just a picture. It's the angle, the cropping and everything, right? So I think that's a great, it's a great topic. Well, here comes another question from Diana Lambertson. Hunting is big in Alaska. What are the, law, the laws on lead ammo? That's an interesting one. Mm -hmm. You know, Jack better answer that because I, I don't know. Alaskans are, I do are, not know, but if I had to guess, Alaska will be the last ones to change. Exactly. Alaskans, that would be my Alaskans attitude. Alaskans are very stubborn. They don't like Washington, D.C. They don't like other people. Tell, that's why they moved to Alaska. That's why their grandpa moved to Alaska. They just want to do their own thing. So, no, so I don't know. Gonna, I really don't. Yeah, they, they will kill unnecessarily as long as they can get away with it. That's my, my answer. Well, there's a lot of... Uh, yeah, unnecessarily. There's a there's a lot of uh, subsistence year round hunting up there, and it's allowed, you know. So, well, it's not the yeah the issue that this lady brings up isn't about year round hunting. What she's bringing right. up is the fact that you could use lead bullets or not use lead. You could use other things, and the lead, unfortunately, is left even in good, well hunted, needed. S sustainable living uh, if you leave the damn lead out in the carcass then any predator doesn't matter what it is whether it's a scavenging golden eagle a bald eagle a, a wolverine picks this up and, and of course then you kill the surrounding animals because you used irresponsibly used lead shot where you didn't need to do that you could have used other metals that are not poisonous but alaska you're right will be the last people to use common sense i hate to say that and yeah, another a, a, an interesting question from VA Eagle. I certainly know her. Uh, does does beautiful videos. Never heard of this, but can eagles get salmonella from eating raw meat? <laughs> well, if you're asking me, the answer is, in some cases is probably yes, but generally speaking, the answer is no. The eagles are a scavenger, like turkey vultures and so on, and the, their whole system. It, um, it is designed to process effectively most things that are, are considered bad and contaminants. I mean, the bacterial contaminants and so on. So the eagles generally don't get a problem, but they can, if you go from uh, bacteria, they can pick up some of the diseases, the West Nile virus and so on, where which is not from eating the food, but it's transmitted from mosquitoes and so on, they can get some of the same diseases. But generally speaking, the diseases from putrid food, they don't affect eagles. I mean, they're, they're, their livelihood is based on eating putrid food. So uh, generally, that the answer is no, they don't get it. But there are th things that can be transmitted to, to eagles, particularly the, transmitting the pesticides and the heavy metals from the carcasses. 
Right. I think, my goodness, we spent quite some time here. So um, I have, uh, again, not kept my promise to keep this to an hour. We are at now at one hour, 44 minutes. But I think, <laughs> but, I, but, 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 but I, but I think it's, uh, it's uh, you know, because we had a very lively, non-controversial discussion, as David said. Okay. <laughs> Although no I don't call Well, every, every, everything with David is controversial in, in one sense. He doesn't. No, that's why his definition of controversial is a bit different to other people. But it's okay. It's fine, you know. <laughs> what is controversial? I don't understand. Everything you've said and we've discussed is pretty straightforward. It's not controversial. <laughs> Okay. Well, a, fi a final. Let's take a final question from Mark Horner. Who will sleep more on the flight to Anch from Anchorage to Dutch, <laughs> Christian or Jack? Uh, you know, actually, I can from my from my perspective, I can tell you, uh, I probably won't sleep much on there because it's very squashy and it's very interesting. I mean, once you leave Anchorage, you it's like leaving the United States. At least that's my that's uh, that's my uh, impression. I don't know what you have to say to that, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> um. I'm bringing my earplugs because Christian does like to snore. I remember that. So that he's a good sleeper. Oh, my goodness. Okay. So now I'm going to make a controversial comment. I had <laughs> Christian travel with me. We went and drove to Alaska one time and back. And Christian has this incredible ability. He'll turn to you and say, well, I'm now going to have a minute and a half. And you look at his watch. No, I'll take two minutes now. And he falls asleep and snores for two minutes. And he wakes up and he's ready to go again. <laughs> so I think Christian will take full advantage of the moments that he gets when he gets them. It doesn't matter where and where they are. He will take his sleep when he needs it. And wonderful that he's able to do that. That's why he's so darn bright. He can sleep on a dime. I admire that ability. Thank you, Christian. Okay. Well, well, thank you, both of you, really. Um, thanks for this, uh, this great time. So the next time you're probably going to hear of us is... Well, hopefully we'll meet uh, tomorrow um, in uh, Anchorage, that is, uh, Jack and I. I think I may have more problems at the moment to get to Anchorage. It depends whether the, you know, what the, what the condition of Vancouver Airport is. But nevertheless, I'm sure we'll meet. And the idea then really is, is that Jack and I are going to do some live broadcasts if the internet holds up to it. It's supposed to have improved drastically now in, uh, in, in, in Dutch Harbor, which is exciting, very different to three years ago. If that is so, you're going to hear much more. I just quickly wanted to make you aware, I have uh, now uh, just launched a new channel called Patreon. And um, it's more exciting than just PayPal or anything because uh, you get rewards. And just think of it, where if you spend $2 on coffee, all you need to do is spend $2 on a video just to support. If, if I get 3,000 people supporting me for $1 or $2, uh, we are off and running and we can make this channel even a lot better. So that's, that's the idea. And um, Jack and I uh, will we'll, um, show a live broadcasts from there, but we'll also do some unlisted ones for those who, who get this as special reward, they can go, we will show a lot of more details. So that is the, uh, you, you know, that, that is the bait that we're putting out. And it's, it's supposed to be exciting. That's what it's all about. But in any case, you're going to hear from Jack and myself very soon. And um, yeah, uh, when I'm back, uh, you'll hear more from, from, uh, Jack, uh, from David and myself. Uh, we'll be, uh, you know, we'll be doing some, some of the um, transmitter stuff which is quite exciting. So I'm working on a documentary. So lots of exciting things coming up. In April, I'm going to Australia. In May, I'm going to Ecuador. In June, I'm going back to Australia. In July, I'm going to Germany. So there are lots and lots of things coming up. <laughs> it's not going to get wow. boring, okay? <laughs> so so you, wow. you have a good... I want the two of you to have a great time and, and, and give a good blessing to all those wondrous Alaska giant eagles, okay? Okay, we'll do that. Okay, so uh, thank you to both of you. So I'm just going to switch, um, you know, disconnect you now. Thanks for thanks for being on the show. Great, and uh, Jack, looking forward to see you tomorrow. And um, oh, bright and early. Okay, yep. and I'll see I'll see you back in a week. Okay, thanks. Okay, see you later, David. Yep. Bye, bye, everybody. Have a good yeah. trip. Yeah, you too. Take care. Okay, let's see now. Uh, get yourself back in here. Uh, one second. Let me just get this back. Okay, here we go. Okay, very nice. So, we're all back now. <laughs>
thank you, thank you all of you for 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 uh, being here for all your great questions. I think uh, this has been a very different um, day again with all the interviews. Again, my my condolences to the Berry uh, people. I could see I could follow the chats a lot. Well, thank you for the donations. My goodness, the donations have just been pouring in. I would like to really thank all of you. Uh, I, I'm just looking at the list here. It's just incredible. I'm absolutely grateful. I know Amanda has contributed. I'm just going to look up quickly and, 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 and see there have been really very generous donations coming in. I so appreciate that. And those, by the way, who donated, I will uh, make sure that you uh, become uh, a, an intimate part of the um, Dutch Harbor. So that goes for Amanda and a few others. I'm going to take note of that later. I wanted to really thank you from my heart. This is what makes my life wonderful, really. I, I'm, uh, you, you know, this gives a lot of meaning. I think um, David Hancock, being a, a serious conservationist, uh, I've learned so much from him, from, from um, Jack, where I'm going tomorrow. Uh, it'll be possible for me to see things that I would never be able to see because his knowledge of the Bering Sea is just so incredible. The intimate connections he has, this is what makes life so special. I'm very grateful for that. I'm, I'm humbled by, by uh, all your generosity for, for supporting the channel. I'm humbled by the community that we have. It's very encouraging. It really is, is, is very encouraging. I want to grow this. Uh, from my heart and I wanted to wish you all um, a very good uh, night and thank you for joining. Have a wonderful weekend. In a few hours I'm off to Dutch Harbor. Um, just hold your thumbs that everything's going to go well and now I just have to find the stop streaming button and here it is. So thanks a lot to all of you and um, see you soon from Dutch Harbor. I hope. I hope all goes well. Thank you.